Yeah. Well, good morning. Good morning. Yes, welcome. What a great good turnout. Good morning, Anton. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Profile and Courage. We're very proud of you last night. Yes. yes. It's a great evening. Yes. Hold it up. What do you mean it's not on? Is it, it is on? on. All right, good. Well, it's a great evening. We, uh, we're so grateful for the support. And I thought the three galleries were terrific. Yes. And we appreciate Lance coming, staying overnight and coming this morning uh, due to popular demand. So, uh, Lance, I got to tell you, I got wound up last night and I couldn't sleep. And I'm tossing and turning. I figured, well, I'll turn on the TV. And oh, God, that's good. So, um, I turned on the TV to Daystar Network. It's one o'clock in the morning, and what comes on? The Lance Wall now show. And he taught a great lesson on about Daniel. And I thought it was interesting that uh, he mentioned Ezra and Nehemiah. And we just finished those books in this Bible study. So next week we're going to start studying the prophets primarily the prophets relating to Israel and the end times. I feel like it's uh, <clears throat> led to do that. I think uh, in Ezekiel, uh, God tells Ezekiel to be a watchman on the wall and let people know what's coming. So we'll study those next week. And then November 5th, we've got Mr. Frank Ball, our <coughs> roaring writer. He has helped this ministry publish books and people get them sold and printed. He's a terrific mentor uh, in the writing part. So we appreciate you, Frank, and uh, thank you for all your support for the ministry. And now I'm gonna turn this over to my wife of 44 long, wonderful years. <laughs> and, Oh, six more, we make 50, honey. <laughs> All right. After Dr. Cooper's message last night, I'm going to do what Lance did, and I'm going to change my evil ways. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> But thank you. Thank you to all of you. As I look around the room, I know most of you, if not all of you, were there last night. We appreciate that. We appreciate your purchase of tickets. We appreciate any donations you made. Most of all, we appreciate your presence. I was not there last night. <laughs> okay, let's start I was with you the way you. Where were you? I want to know right now. I was across the way to Is this the time reunion. thing you've got here to keep me on track? <laughs> this is hilarious. Okay. <laughs> well, no way. Long as you want. Uh, that's so funny. That's great. I yeah. tell people, let's, what I need is a countdown. Like, somebody's got to stop me. Like my wife just goes like that. Stop. Just stop. <laughs> so, your job. Uh-oh. How long do you normally 2 p.m. You know, at least you got half hour, 45 yeah, minutes. Really good. For you. Well, I mean, not, hey, I can't flew in from College Station. You guys have a great airport. <laughs> I just I flew in last night to get here. I didn't know they had an airport in College Station. I'm always, I'm always flying to Houston. Nobody told me. And suddenly, my secretary said, "Well, why are you flying from Houston?" Lance, so I didn't know. Turn the mic on. It's on. I'm the same situation you were in. It's on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can swallow it. <laughs> How's that? Is that, is that any better? Yes. How did George Whitfield preach to thousands of people without a PA system? That's what I want to know. Yeah, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. <laughs> that song, Hallelujah, what a beautiful song. It got me all verklempt. I was feeling all happy, and then I got all melancholy. Hallelujah. <laughs> what would you like to talk about? i got so many things we could talk about. But I'd like to find out what people are hearing. You're hearing the prophets. You're talking about the end times. Yes. You've been talking about the prophets lately? Yes. 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 Is that interesting? So when you see the news and you look at what's going on in Israel, it kind of makes you think that you might be onto something. You might be on, God might be revealing something to you about what He's up to in the earth. Let's talk about this for a second. As I said last night, but I'll repeat for the two people that did make. <laughs> I have a Jewish background. God sovereignly and, and divinely revealed. My father tried to hide it from me. I come from a line of rabbis on my father's side, left side of the family. Both my brothers are professors at universities. My family's just destined, I guess, to 
to be teaching all the time or something. The, um, but the, uh, the Cohens uh, that came out of Germany and that emigrated to the United States, the Levites were actually a tithe of the portion of Israel. When the tribes were being formed in God's design for ministry, he only wanted 10% of the tribes involved with temple maintenance, teaching, and the functions of the sanctuary. 90% of Israel had a job. They had to expand the real estate and domain of the kingdom. Now we've got this, I want you to catch it. I'm going to say some very radical things, but at this stage in our life, I think we should be objective. We have a lot of history. And I'm just challenging you to realize you're alive at a time of transition in God's agenda and administration, which means he's changing the way he's doing things, but it's not inconsistent with what he's already done. It's just different than he did before. So there's a lot of opportunities for people to have warfare and strife because when God shows up at the next level, it's a different manifestation that's consistent with everything he's done before, but anyone can fight with something new because it's not familiar. Does that make sense? Yes. So Jesus is walking on the water, of course, and the disciples cry out in fear. They think it's a ghost, a phantom, a spirit being, which isn't, by the way, a very encouraging sign for 12 men who are being trained as exorcists to be crying out. <laughs> Just leave that point for the moment. <clears throat> They're crying out in fear because there's a phantom being walking on the water approaching them. And Jesus says, from the distance, it is I, be not afraid. But what, 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 what did they do? They saw him doing something he never did before, walking on water. Was that inconsistent with anything he did before? No, everything he did was miraculous. How do you have a precedent? On the other hand, his voice and his word confirmed what he was doing. So God gives us the Bible and he gives us the ability to hear his voice so that we have a steady compass setting with which to test the manifestation. Is this of you, Lord? And if it's not of you... Uh, it won't be of you because the word, it contradicts the word, and it contradicts what God is saying to us. What God is saying to us is probably the weakest part of it. The strongest part is what is God is saying in the word. Does that make sense to you? Yes. And it's not unusual for God's preachers. And pre I'm just going to look it up now because it's just one of my weird things I've got. It's just whatever I write down, whatever God wants me to say, I get in the last 30 seconds before I stand up. So I'm struggling trying to find verses in the Bible, wishing a person would do a second song because I'm hearing God clearly 30 seconds before I talk. <laughs> I didn't have time to look it up. I was heading there, but uh, I didn't get there. So I was going to go to the Mount of Transfiguration because I know in there is an interesting verse. Jesus is manifested in a way he never manifested before. What? It is the unveiling of his glory. And he's illuminating that dark mountaintop as he's silhouetted against the night. And Moses and Elijah appear talking to him. And Peter and James and John are up there on the mountain sleeping during a divine visitation. <laughs> when, they, when Peter wakes up, he sees it. And there's a great line right there if you look it up. Where is it? Somebody find it. It's John's gospel. It's in, 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 in God, oh, forget it. We'll just go. When Peter wakes up, the Bible says something interesting. And he starts talking out of what he sees. And then the Bible makes his commentary, not knowing what he said. It's a commentary meaning Peter was talking, but didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> not knowing what he said. Just remember this. When God shows up, it will always be the urgency of people that are looked to as pon pontificators, prophets, and pulpiteers to interpret the times. And a lot of times we're talking because it's our obligation. We have This is our anointing is to talk to people about what God is doing, but we don't always know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and that's biblical. <laughs> Until the Lord speaks, we're crying out of something that might be him. We're, we're explaining and we got the wrong interpretation. My favorite line is this. I'm studying uh, leadership emergence theory, leadership theory called Theory U at MIT. I really, I'd like to get certified and I just don't want to go to live in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I already have one. Anyway, theory is a fascinating concept put together by a group of, you know, and this is as far as um, the natural mind can go in terms of Imagine if you have a group of scenario planners, like from Shell Oil Company, and perhaps these are people that, that are, maybe there's a few Christians among them, but basically these are people whose job is to forecast the future for their organizations. So there are people in the United Nations, in the State Department, in the Pentagon, their whole business 
is to try to anticipate the unfolding events that are happening in the Middle East and create a projection of scenarios that's called scenario planning. What if this scenario happens? Well, we've already thought about that. What about this one? We have a white paper on that. So the people that do the scenario planning are experts at intuiting unfolding events and anticipating where they're going. In the Old Testament, we had a Jewish group that did this. And uh, they were the sons of uh, Issachar. And the tribe of Issachar's primary business was to understand the times and give advice to leadership as to what we ought to do in, this, in the nature of the current unfolding events happening in the arc of God's dealings with our people. And every now and then the sons of Issachar would have a clarifying moment and they'd speak clearly. One clear moment is when David is emerging and Saul is at war with him and the sons of Issachar, they dragged their, their feet on this thing for a little while, but they finally rose up and said, in private, we're going to tell you what we believe. We believe Saul's house is coming down. David's house is going up. David's going to have the dynasty, not Saul. You're better aligning with David for the future. And then the tribes of Israel made their, their gradual mo, mo, you know, movement over to David's kingdom. But Issachar's tribe was the consulting to the Jewish scenario planning consultants. <laughs> and they'd anticipate where things were going. But my favorite verse with uh, Theory U is, is the fact that, that's uh, on a straight line, really. Theory U says that there is a future, now catch this, that is seeking to become manifest. Yeah. I am one of the few people that I know in the body of Christ who, who appreciates God showing up on a bigger canvas than most people are looking for. And they're looking for him in the the Christian book section. I'm looking for him in the entire library. Amen. Because I've learned something. That he that ascended on high gave gifts unto men, the psalmist said, yea, even the rebellious, that they may praise him. I believe that God gave to Ford the capacity to build a car. I believe he gave to Edison the ability to find out how to create light. I don't have to make the argument that either one of them was a Christian because it's arguable that maybe they weren't. But I'm still driving a car and I'm not living by candlelight. <laughs> because God gives gifts to men, even rebellious, yes. that they may praise Him. So I search the universe for wisdom. And then I bring it to the rigorous test of how does it line up with thus saith the Lord. If it isn't in the Word, I reject it. But if it, it might be that the religious mindset is simply not exploring large enough, and the secular mind, not limited by the constraints of religious thinking, looks for truth in all these places where they stumble upon God and then we kind of resist it until someone explains it to us and it's no longer frightening or sounding non -critical. Does that make sense to you? Yes, absolutely. Or you can call this chapter in a book, Drums in the Sanctuary. The arguments that we really fought over during the great battles of the church. Well, I'm not going to bring those heathen instruments in. They're bringing demons in the church. Then, you know, so pastors, what do they do? Well, they just encompass the drum section in plastic now. So if you see a guy furiously going away, you're you know, figuring out a compromise. The point is, drums, in the, drums aren't a problem in the sanctuary. Or fog machines. Although, I'll tell you the truth. Every mega church I go into that has one of those fog machines. And all those preachers with their skinny jeans and fog machines. <laughs> I have asthma attacks as I'm preaching. <laughs> Turn those things off. You're killing me here. <laughs> Old Jewish people weren't meant to inhale fog machines. <laughs> Where was I going? Are you paying attention? <laughs> okay. All right, so now. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. So I remember one time I'm in, I'm in a pulpit right here. Believe me, there's a, there's, a, there's a direction I'm going in in the madness of my, my uh, communication. I'm in a pulpit here in, um, in Carrollton, Texas, Mega Church, Covenant Church. I was, I was on the board. In the and I remember I was in the pulpit. I had, a, I had an epiphany. I had a revelation. Let's go to the Bible here. I'll get you one Bible verse here before we get started. Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm saying, very you is the unfolding future that God is giving you because there's a future that's seeking to become manifest. And God's looking for somebody that will cooperate with the future that wants to show up. But if you're happy where you are, you're not seeking. If you're satisfied where you are, you're not looking and you're not knocking and you're not persisting. You have to be discontented with the status quo in order to work with God on creating what doesn't exist. Amen. Therefore, dissatisfaction is the gift God gives you when he wants to take you to another level. So I'm going to Hebrews. 
chapter 11. I'm in that pulpit up there. I'm preaching and I'm getting a revelation while I'm talking. And I have a split second to decide in my head, do I have a clear enough revelation to include it in what I'm preaching? Or will I open up a can of worms by having a revelation without an explanation or any illumination and I just drop it on 10,000 people and let the pastor clean it up next week? There you go. There you go. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11. Here's the revelation. Peter gets up, sees Jesus. He says, that's talking. So say, Lord, we should be uh, making, we should stay here. And we should make a tabernacle to Moses and one to Elijah and one to you. We'll have three of them. I mean, this is like this is like a celebrity uh, apprentice show here. It's fantastic. And the, the Bible says, and this he spake, not knowing what he said. Meaning, he's talking, but he doesn't know what he's talking about. That should inspire you sometimes. That's the, that's the future church sometimes is talking when it doesn't know what it's talking about. But later on, it'll get its message straight. In order to give revelation, but just didn't have the right interpretation. Here's another one of those mystery verses. That'll humble you. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham, my forefather, when he was called to go out to the place where he would receive an inheritance, he went out by faith, not knowing where he was going. I looked at that. And I thought, how hilarious. I mean, if you really think about it. He's got, this is the future of the move of God. The hopes and dreams and aspirations of all the world are lie upon you tonight. For the Messiah must come from the loins of Abraham, and Abraham must be led by God. And he's going forth and doesn't know where he's going. <laughs> and I thought, what a great slogan for a really honest leader to say, follow me. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> I thought I'd actually got to make that my slogan for my university. <laughs> follow me. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> And the reason why that makes sense is because 90%, 99% of everyone that thinks they know where they're going don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Far humbler to say, we don't know what we're talking about, we don't know where we're going. Then God says, I can work with that guy. <laughs> because we got a box over here. Did I tell you to test these pens? What did I tell you? <laughs> he says, hey, I got a pen for you. I said, did you test the pen? He said, no. I said, rookie ever. <laughs> There's two more up there. Of course. <laughs> we'll work through these things. There's people. a whole box behind it. <laughs> we run out of revelation when these things don't work. That's the problem. Uh -oh. Future seeking to become manifest. So God has a future seeking to become manifest. And so therefore, here you are over here. There's a future that wants to be manifest, so the future wants to come to you. But the problem is, you're not starting here. This is the state of a person whose hunger is such that they are wanting something to show up that hasn't showed up yet. Therefore, they are dissatisfied. This, set, this, but. People wonder how come nobody can read my writing. It's because when I don't know how to spell a word, I make it such that no one knows if I spelled it right. <laughs> this is a great secret of whiteboard technology. <laughs> People go to my phone, but how can you interpret this? I said, oh, it's a revelation. <laughs> Hunger. <laughs> Dissatisfaction. So how many people are still hungry? It's very hard at the end of your life to find people that are hungry unless they're genuinely... Their primary needs are met. They have like a Maslow hierarchy. Their physical needs are met. Their social, their psychological. That's the perfect time for God to use people is in our age. Because we're not struggling through all the significance issues of youth. Now our issues are finishing well. Having done the assignment God gave us to do. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm not interested in how I can prolong my life on earth. I'm interested in how to lead this life gloriously so when I see Jesus, I am satisfied that I've done the work I was called to do. That's all I care about. Living long enough to accomplish what he wants me to do. i got all eternity to live doing the next thing. I want to make sure I have something to present. I have to have a crown to throw at his feet. Therefore, I'm not satisfied because God has more he wants to do that he hasn't done. Thank you, Don. I appreciate that. <laughs> Do you think this is why the church? I'm not going to get in a theological problem with you here. I don't want to fight with everybody. But everybody's focused on the rapture as now. Well, the Lord's coming back any second. I get that. The imminent return of her. I just think we're focusing on the wrong thing. Where our focus should not be on things getting so bad that any day now, I'm out of here. <laughs> to me, that sounds like a supremely selfish perspective. 
Well, you know, the Lord gave me a dream about those icebergs. I'm on the Titanic. I've already got that first life raft right outside my room. I'm on that. Bye-bye, suckers. I hardly think that's the disposition of Jesus on board the Titanic. The, uh, but since we're going in a direction we do not know, it does, it not, does not mean that we're not being led. So the other side of that is Abraham was being led. It's just that he did not have a map for where God was about to take him. And that's where the church has got to go. It's got to explore off the map. Yes. Now what I love about you as a group is you're a word people. You're not here trying to beat down all the doors of the neighborhood, trying to fill this place up, get a children's church next door. See, how many do we have this week? How many do we have? You're here because you're hungry for the word of God. My kind of synagogue right here. You're here for the word. You're not here for the healthy food, that's for sure. <laughs> I can't believe if you had Dr. Cooper last night at the event. I come back there rousing around the table. I'm looking for something. I don't know, some carrots or something. I, I probably I won't like it, but at least it's there. I was sitting. I, I sat down last night on the platform to talk to one of my young disciples who flew in out of town. I think my wife paid him to show up to honor me. So, <laughs> so uh, he's coming to Tony. So I go, Tony. He goes, hey, uh, you know, want, want, want me to uh, I'll work on your neck? So he travel. He work on my neck. Yeah, I'll work on my neck. I better, boy, I better, uh, I gotta work on it. And I'm sitting behind uh, Dr. Cooper in his wife's chairs. I noticed there was vanilla and chocolate cake last night. I know that because Donna and I did a complete architectural excavation of the chocolate cake. Layer by layer, we're analyzing what's in there. I ate the whole thing. Then I saw there was a vanilla cake. You know what? I found a perfect, beautiful, pristine, like picture-perfect vanilla cake was sitting in front of Dr. Cooper's wife. Then I noticed the chocolate cake was sitting in front of him. Then I realized there were the only two people at the table who hadn't touched the desserts. That's, I saw that. Did you notice that? Yes, I did. But I'm challenged by him. You know why? Because he's walking out, he's modeling and demonstrating the possibility that somebody could be 92 years old and be functioning at the level of oxygenated thinking that he's at. Yeah. I mean, my God. Yeah. It's one thing if you're lean or if you're energetic, but when you're thinking and you're lucid and you're talking and you're, and it's close consecutive logical communication, like a little Ben Shapiro. I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> I'm inspired by that. So I'm going to give it a try. I'm not sure what I'm trying yet. <laughs> not that chocolate cake. I'm not going to try that chocolate cake. But there's a future seeming to be manifest. My friend Kim Clement was a great South African prophet. <coughs> and he used to rap. He had a rap that he used to say, You're somewhere in the future, and you look much better than you look right now. <laughs> I remember he pointed to a very overweight pastor, and I thought and he got carried away. He said, You're somewhere in the future, and you look much thinner than you look right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Fast, you look much thinner than you look right now. But you are somewhere in the future. God has a prophetic purpose for your life that has not yet been fulfilled. Every one of you should be hungry and dissatisfied with the life you're in because you have a prophetic you that is still waiting to manifest. Abraham must become the father of many nations. Right now he's wandering and doesn't know where he's going, but at least he knows what he's looking for. He's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. He's got a blueprint in his mind. And then God leads him step by step by circumstance. Obedience right now. He doesn't show him the whole map. He takes him step by step by step. The future is seen to be manifest. And there's three levels in theory. You, we're not going to go into this whole thing right now. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't take much to make us happy, does it? <laughs> Functional marker. Theory U. There's three levels in theory U, and without getting into this in too much depth, it has to do with letting go of your preconceived idea of what the future must look like that God is showing you. Because so many times the problem is you have an idea of what it looks like, and you're you're forcing God to have to show up on your terms. How many of you know God just won't always cooperate with you like that? <laughs> Bob Mumford years ago had a vision. Uh, and, and, and the picture was the Lord was talking to him about he wanted him to turn around to repent to change his attitude and here Bob was just doubling down on what God had to do and God was saying I'm not going to move on this you're going to move on this you have to do this I'm not going to move on this you're going to have to move on this and he shows him a vision of a, of, a, of a cat that is being rubbed by this hand only the fur is being rubbed in the opposite direction 
and the cat's like bristling like that. And the voice is saying, just turn around, kitty, turn around. Because God's not going to change what he's doing, so you just got to adjust your position. Turn around. That's repentance is turn around. Is it not hard for you to kick against the pricks? That's what the Lord says to the uh, the Saul Tarsus when he's persecuting the church. God says, hey, th- it, how's this working for you? It's working good? It's like Hamas in Israel. My God, demonic and stupid. How's this working for you? You think you're gonna, What did you think was going to happen? You're going to do that to the Jewish people? It's like uh, the former Israel prime minister said. He said that Jew, he said the he said the Palestinians are terrorists. He said they they think that they that they're going to uh, drive us crazy. Just because we're civilized, more than them, we're we're like a uh, like a Western European villa in the midst of a violent jungle. Yes. And every now and then they come to scare us and to terrorize us and to drive us crazy to leave the jungle. Is what they don't know is the Jewish person can out crazy the crazy. <laughs> what a weird statement. We can out crazy the crazy. And what they're doing right now is we're gonna out crazy them. You think you could do that? We're gonna be out crazy. We're not gonna care what the world says. We're gonna care what the world says. Like our survival is based upon our looking out for ourselves anyway. Mm-hmm. They know that. But we need some Christians that allow crazy the crazy. Instead of trying to worry about making a mistake, I think God risks I think God likes risk taking. You know the parable of the talents when, when, they're, when they're brought into stewardship and they have to account for what they're doing. The Lord called it wicked and slothful to be overly careful with guarding the truth he gave you. While we're preserving it, we're trying to guard it conscientiously. What he wanted was some risk. Put yourself out there where there's a possibility of losing and a possibility of winning. God wanted risk and reward. He didn't want playing it safe and hiding it out to give it back to him. So here's the theory you idea. You have to let your uh, you have to let your idea about the future, the way that you see it, uh, your future, the way you see it in your head, the way that you um, see it in terms of uh, what you what you are willing to do. Well, the basic is, is the head, the hand, and the heart. But I don't have time to go into this. I'm just going to put it this way: that there's three levels of humbling that go on where you let go of your attachment to how the future has to look and you begin to cooperate with it as it starts to show up. There's an interesting word that uh, I think uh, describes what happens in media that drives me crazy. It's called suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. It means that when the evidence is saying one thing, you have a narrative regarding Trump or America or this or that, and you must impose your narrative on the evidence, reconfigure it if necessary, to add up to what you want to say. It's called suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. It's a faculty of the depravity of the human condition that makes the narrative fit what we willfully want it to mean, rather than letting the truth emerge and investigate it and say, you know, it's maybe taking me to a conclusion I didn't, I didn't want, I didn't think was true, but this is where the evidence of the case is leading me. Does that make sense? Yes. It's like the plot of a great movie. Everybody thinks they know what the storyline is, and you find out. Wait a second, the person you thought was the hero is the villain, and the person you thought was the villain is actually the hero exposing the plot. <laughs> the point is, we have, we have this idea of what the future is supposed to look like. We have an attachment to it emotionally showing up. And there comes a moment in the heart where you are not only open to what God is wanting to send, but you're cooperating with it. It's at that moment that this is why they call it theory you. Oddly enough, you have to go down in order to come up into the future that needs to manifest. You have to empty yourself of your own preconceived agenda, will, ideas, and be humble enough. So this is like the, the Jews did this the first century. They went to the synagogues. They said, this Jesus who I preach to you is the Christ. Not a us or a church. That's a normal message. If you were in the first century and you were in a synagogue, and you're sacredly holding that Torah, and some guy like me comes up and says, you're waiting for a Messiah. The guy that you heard about in the news that they killed in Jerusalem, he rose from the dead. He's actually the Messiah. You'd be going, what? It would only be the people that have a love of the truth that would hang out for that doctrinal discussion. The other people are going to persecute it and shut it down. That was basically what happened. 
It's a threat. It's blasphemy. You hear about that crazy sect? Saul. Stop them. They're destroying the... They're actually gaining territory. It's, it's, it's a terrible viral propaganda. It's lying thing about this Nazarene. And he goes, boom! Is it not hard for you to kick against bricks? In other words, turn around, kid. He ain't going to stop. I'm going to keep I'm going to keep moving whether you like it or not. You're better off acclimating yourself to what I'm doing. Therefore, what is the future that God is seeking to make manifest? We should ask ourselves that. We should ask ourselves, are we hungry enough and dissatisfied enough? And then are we open-minded enough to embrace the breadcrumbs that God is showing us, even if it leads us to a direction we didn't want? I remember Leonard Raven had a great quote. He said, it was like a prayer, Thy kingdom come, even in my own undoing. So I think about America. I pray for America. I love America. I want to see America succeed. I hear songs like, I'm proud to be an American. I'm getting all fricked. I'm crying. I love it. I, I, I love all that. But what if God has to break America to make America great? What if he's got to break? And, what, and what, how, much, how much capacity do we have to accept the process that God's going to put America through? There'll be a lot of people falling away. They fall away because it's not working out like they thought. Well, maybe God's plan is I'm going to give you what you want, but it's, I'm going to do it in a different way than you thought. But I promise you when it happens, it'll be biblical and you'll see it in the Bible. It's just that we didn't want to see it in the no. Bible because it didn't fit our preconceived idea of what we're praying for and what we want God to do. That's why this theory you fascinates me. You have to let go in order to let come. Now, this is what they said. I can't believe these, these scientists and researchers at MIT say, in order for the future to manifest, there's a point at which you have to let go of your own preconceived idea of exactly how it has to happen so that the future that is wanting to show up then can be discovered more easily because you're not resisting it by suppressing it every time you see the evidence of it. So, I want to maintain an open mind. In terms, I'm going to have the word as my test, but I know that the word of God often is in a box, and God sometimes is taking me outside the box to build a bigger revelation. Yes. So, that's where I started talking about seven mountains. I talked about seven mountains, and it kind of became like a short if you never heard what that message is. You ought to hear it at least once. I'll give it to you the fast version. Oh, yeah. So the seven mountains is simply this. All nations and all culture are shaped by seven vertical institutions that disciple culture. If you really want to affect the culture, you have to respect the fact that these seven verticals are a hierarchy of influence, and whoever's at the top of that hierarchy has the most influence over the culture. So it's kind of Darwinian in the sense that there's a hierarchy there. And uh, in the church world, the church becomes the vehicle that God plants on the earth, kind of like the first wave of civilization is when on the beaches of humanity is when the gospel lands. Fascinating point. I'll give this to you real quick. Uh, there's a, there's a, the, the Woodbury is the name of a, a, of a sociologist. Just write down the name Woodbury. Go look him up. He doesn't want anyone to know what he's done because he doesn't. Here's a guy who is doing data analysis on culture. And the data is taking him where he doesn't want to go. The data is showing him that for the lowest mortality rate, the highest level of freedom, the highest level of health and literacy, the lowest degree of crime, the, the, the least amount of corruption, oddly enough, is found in certain kinds of nations and cultures. Then he keeps following the breadcrumb, and he's a statistician, and he's got data on top of data. He's going, oh no, it's taken into a conclusion no sociologist wants. The data is that those democracies that are influenced by conversionary Protestant missionaries ended up becoming the countries with the healthiest level, the lowest level of infant mortality, the highest level of aggregate happiness, the greatest degree of health and civility, the greatest degree of educational and economic achievement are Christian nations that were influenced by missionaries whose only goal was converting them to Christ. He's going, oh boy. And now the PhD consultants that want to get your PhD program come around, and they don't know if they want to back this kid. He's going to do his PhD program because the thesis is so odious to the secular intellectual. You're telling me Christianity produces the greatest culture? Yes. <laughs> it's the data. 
I don't like what I'm finding, but what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. And here's the irony. Conversionary Protestants are at the heart of the nations that have the greatest, most stable democracies. Not necessarily conversionary Catholicism, because in Spain and in Portugal <laughs> and other nations, it produced a fragmented cohesion. It didn't have the same power as a robust Luther Protestantism. And uh, nevertheless, it was superior to Islam or communism or totalitarianism. Christianity produces the greatest nations for civilization, so long as Christianity has it. Are we losing my voice here? Yes. Oh. That's, and I, I'm that's losing you. <laughs> Is there a green light? Can you all still hear him? Yeah. yeah. We can hear you. No, it's, 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 uh, well, you can hear me, right? Oh, yeah. Well, if you can hear me, then why don't you put change the battery? It's kind of like the magic markers. Yeah. <laughs> it's not really high tech. We just got to think about those things. Anyway, does this make sense to you so far? Yeah. So Robert Woodbury does his research. Just look him up. You're not going to find him very famous because nobody likes what he discovered. <laughs> so here's the deal. He says the irony is the conversionary Protestants that went to these countries hated politics. <laughs> now here's the crazy thing. They hate politics, so they're not going in as Christian nationalists to go create Christian nations. They're going in for souls. <clears throat> Thank you, my brother. They're going Turn in. Switch. Hmm? Turn the switch on. Turn the switch on. Okay. My, it's my level of complexity right there. <laughs> so are you guys paying attention to this? Yes. So this is this is this is a grenade it's in the schoolyard right now. <laughs> Woodbury finds out the conversionary Protestants went to Africa, they went to, they went to Asia, they went to Korea, they were in Europe, went to the United States, in order to get souls saved, not to create um, a Christian nation. Their goal was old school fundamental evangelism. The problem was, in order to get those people saved and keep them saved, they had to become word people, Bible people, and to do that, we had to teach them how to read. So suddenly, the Christians became the first educators of the poor, the illiterate, and those who would receive the gospel, not the upper class, but frequently the lower class, the common people, the hungry. And they came in multitudes to the, to the gospel in Africa and such, and the next thing you know, they had to teach them how to read, which meant they had to print the Bible in a language they could read, and they had to teach them how to read. What they did inadvertently was they created a literate and educated Christian lower class. Worse yet, gave them biblical principles and a worldview. Now thrift and industry and avoiding vice and being honest and seeking God becomes part of the lower class culture. Before you know it, the lower class is creating a thriving middle class. And the elites don't know what to do with it because the elites are being threatened by the emergence of Christianity in their nations. But history is moving along a certain cycle also, and democracies are starting to rise up, and it looks as though that might be the direction of the future. So the elites, particularly Catholic elites, start Catholic schools so that they can preserve their own version of education. But to do that, they have to compete with the Protestants. So they meet them at the lowest level and have Catholic schools. Now you've got Catholics and Protestants teaching illiterate people how to read and how to practice what you ended up doing inadvertently was you started creating the culture of a Christian civilized nation, which inevitably will lead to the advances that, uh, that this guy discovered in every other area of cultural byproduct, including health and mortality and prosperity and economics and literacy and education, all because of the unintended consequence of conversionary missionaries that ended up creating Christian influence culture, although that wasn't their goal. It was just to get people saved and in the word. Why am I telling you that? Because where in the world do you hear somebody make the argument today that Christianity is the reason why Gaza and Israel have the problem they got? Because if we really practice Christianity and followed its statistical track, we see that the best alternative to the chaos in the world right now is to impose a Christian worldview. Promote a Christian worldview. Abby, we don't even we don't do that. We're half embarrassed about that. We don't even know we got a product that works. <laughs> statistically verifiable. It's like a Dr. Cooper there, you know, I'm hearing him last night. 
I caught this one thing he said. He said, look, if you were to just uh, do 30 minutes a day, five days a week, that's uh, 150 hours of uh, 105, 10, 50, 150 hours worth of, no. Yeah, minutes. 150 minutes, right. <laughs> worth of, yeah, thank God. I was going to talk myself out of it right there. Go, well, uh, I don't know if I to be that healthy. <laughs> So 150 minutes worth of uh, worth of exercise, <coughs> then you're going to statistically outlive other people by six to ten years. I'm thinking six to ten more years of life to be able to do what Jesus called me to do, yeah. and a quality of life. And he said, when they go, you hear what he said? Rather than some disease and illness where it's a gradual retrograde and deterioration, they go fast. It's like they even die great. Yeah. <laughs> I want to live ten years longer than everybody else and go suddenly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm checking that guy out. I start getting him. I hunted him down. I have to respond. I said, "Hey, you know, you probably don't know me, but I'm going to come and visit you." Know, like, Let me <laughs> Theory U says, "I didn't mean to go here." Theory U says, "You got to let go of your preconceived idea to let come the future." The problem with the church world was our conversionary Protestant, our Protestant. It's a CP. Look at that's what it's actually technically with uh, Woodbury. Check out the research. Prove me a liar. You'll be shocked when you see this information about Woodbury. You're going to go, "How come nobody else talked about this with Lance?" Because nobody in academia wants you to know Christianity is the only model of civilization connected to all the data points of civilization and prosperity. That's not the conclusion they want. They're going to keep on digging for something else. But you see the problem here in the church? We separated ourselves from the old model of culture, separation of church and state, separation of us from culture. So what we have is the sacred over here, and what we have is the secular over here. And, but these are the seven, I'm going to give it to you real quick, the church, the seven realms that shape the minds of nations. Well, it's not just church, it's religion. Church where it works. Family, education, government, media, entertainment. I might say news, I'm going to put news media, entertainment, and business or economics. Those seven domains are the seven mountains that will shape culture. I defy you, I challenge you to pick up the newspaper any day and not find the headlines circulating around some aspect of what's happening in one of those seven domains. Seldom church information, by the way, but a lot of religion. So there's your Hamas, there's your Islam. Islam's in the news all the time. That's a religion mountain. But those seven, now that means that at the top of this is the point of greatest influence. At the point of greatest influence, this, this is, now this is not this is what the future paradigm that I had to let come while I was pastoring a church in Rhode Island for 20 years. Because I left the business world. I left, I left my father's oil company. I left the wealth and the prestige of the life that, uh, that I thought I wanted when I became a Christian. I started reading about George Mueller and Dale Moody and Charles Finney and John Wesley. And all. I developed this hero idea that a totally radically sold out Christian is somebody who is advancing the kingdom of God against the forces of hell, bringing revival, seeing people saved, and planting thriving churches, which are replicating that work until all of humanity is, has been impacted by the gospel. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. And while I'm doing that, I'm the perfect person for God to go visit and say, let's talk about that. You've separated yourself from the world. You've gone off and dedicated yourself to revival evangelism and church growth. You're a purist. You've paid the price to do it. Now, how does one make disciples of nations? I said, well, Lord, to make disciples of nations by having strong revived churches with strong Christians going out and getting, if we can get 51% of the people saved, we've created a 51, a tipping point in humanity. More people saved, the more it translates to righteousness. The Lord said, that it doesn't work that way. <laughs> if you got an airplane and you got uh, 300 passengers, it's uh, the six in the cockpit, uh, the flight crew of six. It's about 12 people that are going to take over that flight. They got the microphone, they got the aisles, and they got the cockpit bolted shut. If you hear them say, oh, Akbar, you're in trouble. Because it's going to be 10% or 8% of the passengers control the narrative, the direction, the conversation, and the culture on board the flight. The fact that you have more doesn't mean you have the culture. I started looking at this statistically, like Woodbury, and I realized... Christians outnumber all the other groups we're up against. Realize at the time the LGBTQ movement took off, there was only 3.5% of the country self-identifying as actual homosexual. Not that there aren't more people sympathetic and think it's cool, they think it's okay. I'm saying actually identify as homosexual. 3.5%. You 
You got 33% of people in the United States identify as born again, evangelical, Jesus Christ as Lord Christians, whether they're on fire or half dead, whatever. They're, you already you have 33% against 3%. That's all I need to know. Making you 34 or 35 isn't the problem. The problem is they have an agenda to take over culture and you don't. Hmm. They're going to have same-sex marriage. They're going to have gay priests. They're going to teach LGBTQ in your schools. They're going to get legislators and laws that are going to back them. They're going to have sympathetic news media stories. They're going to have movies and propaganda making it a glorious kind of like a quest for identification of your soul. And then they're going to back it up with businessmen, Peter Thiel, big money. They're going to be propping up investment based upon diversity, equity, and inclusion with BlackRock. They're going to hit all seven mountains, and they'll take, I don't care if you're 60 or 70% of the population, they will make you bow the knee to bail in order to have your freedom. Yes. That's what happens if you don't have a Christian worldview of culture. You're going to give the culture to the devil. Now, well, when did that happen? Well, we actually had influence in all those mountains, but we didn't have a, the, we didn't have a worldview that supported that. We had a worldview that supported conversionary Christianity without penetrating culture. Harvard, I got my first persecution or protest on a college campus at Harvard. Never forget, I was invited to go to Harvard. I found there's a protest organized against me. The state police called me up to warn me. I thought, dang. I had one dear old apostolic minister take me out to breakfast. He goes, Lance, you know, when you start doing the Seven Mountain thing, a lot of us are worried about you, but that proved to be good. For it to be good, solid theology about going to all the world, making disciples of nations. Now, now you're getting involved with politics. And I got to tell you, we'd like to caution you on this. You see, they're, you're in the news now. They're going to be protesting you. Now, remember what happened to Anita Bryant when she had that orange juice thing in Florida? Man, she got involved with that homosexual lobbying group. They threw money advertising. Next thing you know, she's like a demon from hell. It's just, just because she took a Christian stand, her whole career is still. I just want to warn you. That if you follow through in the direction you're moving in, your brand is going to be branded by the left. And uh, and you, who you are and your message is going to be tainted by getting in the wrong fights. I thought, dear God, I just wanted to go to Harvard and talk to the kids. <laughs> I'm going to pray about it. So let me tell you how humbling it is when we actually hear God. I don't really hear God ever tell me lofty things. It's always kind of, it's very, actually, it's almost like a Jewish kind of, it's a Larry David episode, really. So I'm, I'm, I'm praying. I go, Lord, I'm hearing from so-and-so and so-and-so that I should not go to Harvard because of the protest, because of the negative publicity. They're saying it'll be bad for my, my brand, uh, who I am, and it will hurt me. You know what the Lord said to me? Hmm. You won't believe this. He said to me, you're not that well known that it's going to hurt anything. <laughs> said, well, there's a different angle on the subject. You're not that well. Nobody knows who you are. Who are you kidding? Your brand? It's not like your BMW and your car crash. Nobody even knows who you are. Like, oh. Okay, so what do you think I should do? Go! I go, oh, okay. And when the Lord told me, he said, go. I've invited others. And I knew who they were. And they refused because it could affect their brand. Wow. Mm. So you go ahead and hazard your brand. And I'll promote you. Amen. And I'm going to give you more authority for your message coming out of that battle than you'd have avoiding that battle. Yes. Because the battles I put you in increase your spiritual authority. Yes. Write that one down. <coughs> The battles God puts you in, when you come out of them, they've increased your rank. And you know, I went to military school, like I told you last time, my dad sent me three years in military academy, which I desperately need for a person like me. And, uh, <laughs> and so I saw, I saw these stripes on the shoulder, which I knew right away was like a first sergeant. I could see that this was going to be the stripe. I saw the insignia on the arm, which meant the rank was going to go up. I would have more spiritual authority, obeying God, going into the battles he wanted me in, which would be high risk. But then I'd come out with a greater voice. Hallelujah, yes. I'm still really, really unknown. I mean, I'm always entertained by that fact. But I, I, th I feel like being hidden is a blessing because I don't have to have security at my house. I don't have to worry about being assaulted. Most people, I mean, I have my fair share of lunatics that try to get a hold of me. But the reality is I didn't have to have somebody take me in. And then when I, it's so funny when I do events, my staff suddenly uh, has me surrounded by police. It's kind of so bizarre. I do an event. 
And for some reason, their brain kicks in, well, we need to have security. Well, what about before the event? <laughs> I mean, if anybody wants to case me, they just gotta look at me a day before the event. <laughs> I'm shopping for underwear at Walmart. Don't kill me then. <laughs> All right. Let go, let come. So the family mountain, thank God, God arranged it. So they look at the Jewish people. The family mountain between the synagogue, the family mountain, and Hebrew school. The Lord takes these three things. The Jewish people have never been more than 2% of the world's population. And look at my God. They've retained their identity. I mean, whether or not they're a liberal, a Jewish, uh, you know, Democrat, which I can never figure out how, that, how, that, how they come to that conclusion. But uh, whether or they're an Orthodox, conservative uh, Jew. The fact is, the reason why the Jewish people have been scattered all over the universe and regathered in 1948, and it's a miracle that you can pick up exactly where you left off 2,000 years ago. Same Torah, same language, same theology, same practice, same people, the same thing. In the same real estate. And they still can't get along with each other. That's the hilarious part. They have an elections every four months to find out who the new president's going to be. Who's the prime minister? Well, they get, but they're all coming back with the same language, the same Torah, the same reproaches. And the, the, the. Two percent of the population Jewish in the United States. You realize that? Two point five percent at its highest. Look at how Jewish people have influenced culture. From Leonard Bernstein to Alan Dershowitz to uh, to uh, Stephen Sondheim to uh, to uh, Seinfeld. They've shaped everything. <laughs> Only two and a half percent of the population. Why is that? It's a peculiar Abrahamic thing. Because in the DNA of every Jew, they know that if you want to, if you want to survive, you have to go to the top. So that they know they have to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Because the last thing that Nazi lady wants to do is kill her gynecologist. <laughs> 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 I never said that before. <laughs> Sometimes you just say it and you go, well, I don't know if I even should have said that. Church, family, education, government, law comes out of that. You guys get what I'm talking about. The top part is what we call the gates of influence. G-O-A-I. Gates of influence. Whoever's occupying the gates of influence shapes the culture. That's the reason why the Jewish people were taught to be the head and not the tail above and up. I wish every Christian would teach their people how to do this. Instead of pastors preaching about bringing a visitor to church and the most important thing is salvation and having an altar call, I think we should be challenged. Why? Because 10% of the people are called to be walking around with a microphone and preaching. 90% should be occupying territory and expanding the influence of the kingdom. Right? Yes, 90% should be in real. We should be telling our kids, go to the top. Go to the top of media. Go to the top of technology. Go to the top. You're called to be the head and not the tail and bubble and not beneath. Amen. You've got more than the, when the secular person doesn't have the spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the anointing, the favor of God. They don't have, you have all the advantages. You know, they, they don't have, they don't have faith because they don't ever hear this preached. So their idea of being serving God is, should they be a missionary? Should they be a pastor? Should they be a youth leader? Should they go to Bible college? That's not the choice. <laughs> Jewish people, you see, were so smart. Because the, between the synagogue, the Jewish family, and Hebrew school, by insulating them into those three areas of vaccination, I don't care what country you drop down a Jew in, 2% of the population, they can still regather they're still Jews. Yes. We send our kids to college, book 50% of the time they come home a zombie. <laughs> How did that happen? You want to think like a Jew. Why the kid goes there? They're mentally circumcised. They're different than other people. They know it. We don't do that with our kids. And they know they're going to be the head and not the tail. My son, the lawyer. My son, the doctor. It's the Jewish mother's destiny is to speak destiny to those boys. No, it's so ironic, it's not the father. Because the, the Jewish men, to tell you the truth, they're so bullied by these women. <laughs> it's well known, it's well known in our circles. <laughs> you know, who's the problem with the Middle East? You know what the problem with the Middle East is? Abraham listened to his wife. She says, I want a child. I want you to go into that handmaiden over there, you give me a baby. She wanted a baby. Abraham, okay, do you want to live? Then we have a baby. He goes in, well, what does he produce in Ishmael? Yeah. The whole thing is because his wife is bullying him and bossing him around the house, telling him what she wants, and he's got to get it for her. She's not happy. <laughs> Story of Jewish households. <laughs> anyway, that's another subject. Thank God I married a Gentile. 
She puts up with whatever I want to do. George woman would have divorced me already, I know. Bless her, Lord. Seriously, I travel 200 days a year, 200 days. One day she's lecturing me. I said, can you imagine? I just ran into somebody who's a military person. They're a military. She said to me, her husband is gone 200 year, days a year. How can you sustain a family or a marriage with a husband who's gone 200 days a year? She looked at me like I had two heads. <laughs> she stepped back, she says, how many days have you gone a year? <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm talking about a lady whose husband's deployed in the military. He's not even home. Just how many days a year are you gone from your house? Yeah. Yeah. Well, not 200. She looks at me. I go, 200? She goes, I go, my God. That's unsustainable. I dropped the subject right there. Anyway. The secret is I invite her to travel with me a lot. That, 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 then she feels guilty. It says, this is, Jewish people are great at manipulating guilt. It's a great art we have. <laughs> Whatever we're doing wrong, we'll figure out a way to somehow blame you for our problem. <laughs> and, so, and so what I say to her is I say, but you can't travel with me again. She goes, no, I can't. She she's apologizing all the time. It's perfect for me. Because every time I want to go somewhere and I feel like I'm traveling too much, I say, why don't you go with me? I, she's apologizing why she can't go. Don't tell her I told you this. <laughs> I can't go on. So church, family, education, government law. So we do we honestly do we train our people to do this? I'll be I'll be let's talk about it. The, the goal of the pastor, which is why I like what you do. You have like an innovative church here, you have a synagogue. This is the right thing, this is the students of the Torah. The average church is interested in its own growth. The metrics they're looking for in Dallas, Texas is well, how big are we this year compared to last year? And the pastor gets rewarded based upon their ability to build the organization. That's not the assignment. The assignment is how many people are you raising up to be roaring lambs within a community fulfilling their destiny and how are you networking them together with the local church to increase their capacity to occupy more territory in media, art, medical, real estate, or whatever it is that they're called to do. Amen. Yeah. 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 They don't want to hear this. I've done this a gateway. I've done this. I've yes. been all the mega drugs. I've all of this. They know exactly what I'm talking about. Thank you, Lance. It's very interesting. Seven mountains, praise the Lord. Now next week we're gonna have songs. I was like, they don't do it. <laughs> so here's my latest heretical bent I'm on. I'm saying so. If you don't occupy those mind moments of code, then here's the thing. When God says, all right, you guys are in a serious situation, we're gonna have to go into that government, you have to go into that political arena. We're getting a vast education on how government works, how corrupt it is. I mean, all Christians that are concerned about the future of America are getting an education right now. But then all the Christians that don't want to get involved in politics. It just drives me crazy. <laughs> how stupid can you get? Al-Qaeda is in the cockpit. We can get them out. Yeah. Well, I don't want to get involved in cockpit theology. <laughs> God didn't call me to be a vessel of strife. <laughs> I should have a better, every time I talk to Charlie Kirk on the radio, it's always the same thing, it's too bad, I gotta have a better answer for him. Lance, what's the problem with the church? He always, like I'm, like I'm his therapist. What's the problem with the church? Why don't they wanna get engaged with the political stuff? Don't they realize it? It's because to, to let come what God wants to do, they have to let go of what they've been doing. Anyway. So here we are. So I'm going to start an online university. I'm going to do it. It's going to be called Seven and You. It's going to be the best practices and ideas and teaching as to how to ascend that mountain because there's three levels in every mountain. And I really believe that the people that are here on those mountains, well, God will give them superior technology and insight into the coming kingdom. Why? Because we'll show that our calling as the kingdom people is to taste the powers of the age to come. We should be a forte. We should be the kingdom. Should be an exhibition of the. We should demonstrate the powers of the age to come. That means that we should be demonstrating something that is a result they're not getting. And we should be going, pressing into God to show us the best, most innovative way of doing this thing so that the blessing of God can be upon it. Innovation should be led by the church, not by the world. Amen. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. The majority of Christians are... Thy eschatology for Israel comes so that I can get raptured and go to heaven. God's not interested in getting you to heaven. He's interested in getting you heaven to earth. How's That's that for right. a paradigm yeah. shift? Yeah. Yes. We're all anxious to get to heaven. I got news for you. God doesn't want to see you there before the right time. He's got, he's got you deployed on an assignment. You got a little work you got to do for a little sliver of time. You show up at the wrong time. He's going to look at you like that. He's going to, what are you doing here? 
They're like, come, my child, come. So all these pictures of Jesus hugging me, it's going to be like, yeah, this isn't the right thing. You got a job. What are you doing? Checking out early? <laughs> Any questions on this? This is self explanatory. <laughs> this is the prelude to my message today. <laughs> Theory U is creating a space for the future to come. I'm looking for people that are hungry and dissatisfied, that are open minded, because we've been stuck in this paradigm that the church will change the world. And in fact, the only way the church can change the world is if the church goes into the world. I never forget what the Lord said to me. Go into all the world. Go ye into. I love the King James. Go ye into all the world. The Lord said, what part of go ye do you not understand? Yeah. Yeah. I said, I left the business world. I left the career world. I left all the benefits of the country called myself to become a religious fanatic for revival, evangelism, and church planning. And now you're telling me to go back out into Babylon? And he knows it exactly. Now we're talking. Yes. <laughs> now we're communicating. And it makes sense. Why would you take me out to send me back in? Well, I said, uh-huh. That's the journey of every Christian. You go out of the world system, into the kingdom, you get sanctified, sanitized, get the revelation so God can send you back in. That's good. You're supposed to live like an Essene monk out there in the desert. <laughs> so now we're going to go, you know, I said, go into all the world. I did, a, I did a horrific study in the Aramaic and the Greek and the Hebrew. I said, okay, go ye into, literally means... Ye go. <laughs> so that's when I start talking about, I think, I think we're supposed to be raising them. 90% of you people should be like, your whole life isn't, is it here? It's there. And if you wonder why people backslide and become like schizoid, it's because they don't see the relevance of here to there. They don't see how the Bible and the word of God is actually leading them on an adventure where they are when they leave for the rest of the week. Well, you guys get what I'm talking about. God wants to unpack destinies out here. And he wants you to actually contend with your enemies at the gates. What does that mean? I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Think about this. Yes. I will build my ecclesia. That's the actual pronunciation. Ecclesia. Sounds kind of like Transylvania. Yes. I will build my ecclesia. <laughs> yeah. I will build my ecclesia. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the devil is going to try to prevent. Well, how in the world is the devil? Where's my pens? That's all. All right, that's it. The revelation is ending right now. The last one. This is where hell is located. The gates of hell. You want to know where the gates of hell are? They're the spiritual realm up here, looking for agreement here. Because wherever there's agreement with hell, hell can manifest. Wherever there's agreement with heaven, heaven can manifest. But the leverage point for manifestation is higher and more impacting at the top of the producing category in Hollywood, at the top of Wall Street. In other words, there are certain levels of, uh, of the, the cockpit is where you take over the plane, not the restroom. <laughs> so for that reason, these tops of the business, I can tell you in Dallas. Where the top of the business mountain is, where the top of the money market is, where the top of the influence is in media and the Dallas Morning News, every, every state has these seven mountains. Every nation has their national seven mountains. Satan's job is to try to get his people at those gates of influence with their own ideology so that they can shift the nation out of alignment with God's purpose. And how are you going to counter that? Well, preacher... We're going to have prayer and fasting. Well, prayer and fasting releases God to go into these mountains, but it's not a substitute for your obedience. That's right. If you don't go, he don't come. So all that pent up fireworks we got in intercession, prayer and fasting for America is waiting for what? Waiting for God's people to go ye into and ascend quickly to the gates of influence because that's where the gates of hell take over. And here's the great promise. God called you to go there. And what is God called to go there? He's called this ecclesia. And what's the ecclesia? This is crazy. I was going to ask you to just noodle this. This, this only sounds like heresy because no one else preaches it. Where two or more are gathered together in my name. If God can have a prayer group of two or four that are in the entertainment area, in the business area, in the media area, in the government area, in the... If he can get small micro churches that are there to say, Father, what is heaven wanting to do in the education mountain? And we're going to suspend our own agenda right now and just ask for thy will to show up. 
Well, if you seek God and you humble yourself regarding what you think he wants to do, he'll start giving you divine appointments and you'll start having God show up and you'll experience God like a Henry Blackaby unfolding story right on the mountain you're on. Henry Blackaby, it's crazy, it's so hilarious to me. Henry Blackaby, who's, who's totally non-charismatic, was the favorite teacher that we had in charismatic circles to explain to Christians who are all in revival how to follow God because they were having experiences they didn't have a blueprint. Henry Blackaby comes along, totally rejects everything they're doing, but explain to them how to get from A to B. And here's what Blackaby said. It all starts with a love relationship with God. We pray. We start with the love relationship with God. Pray. So we have two or three or four, and your job is to love each other and pray. Father, what are you doing? What are you doing in the business sector right now? What are you doing in, in, in education right now? And what you, wherever God puts you, get two or three others that are feeling, our mountain is this, we're called to this, let's pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What do you want us to do, Father? We're going to suspend our own agenda for right now. And just pray and love him, love each other. Well, what happens is, according to Blackaby, God sends you an envelope. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to join him in what he's about to do. He's not looking for your great idea. He's looking for you to discover his great idea. <laughs> he's not asking you to do something big for him. He's asking you to stop trying to do things and let him do something for you. Yes. He gives you the invitation. Then when the invitation comes, woo, that's where the sparks go. Because I'll put a monkey wrench right here. Because if it's a really big invitation, it's going to really challenge. You're going to you're gonna have to go, wow, you want us to do what? <laughs> if it's a God-sized task. This could be your final big thing you do before you meet Jesus. Go out with some legacy event. You're going to take over the government or change education or start a whole new charter school thing. But the reason why it's tools here is because whatever God is telling you to do, depending on the size and audacity of the assignment, there will be some degree of personal adjustment. Noah, I'd like you to build something for me. It's going to be a big adjustment. <laughs> Abraham, I'm thinking of expanding my family. Big adjustment. You want a big assignment? Get ready for a big adjustment. That's if you want to be in the big league. So you're seeking God? This is my little microchurch model. Microchurch, we're just seeking God over here in Lord and Lands. And then, oh boy, you won't believe what just happened. We just got, I think God's in this thing. This is going to be a big, then what you do is you obey God. This is his footprints right there. Just walking out. Abraham went forth following God. He didn't know where he was going, but he knew he was following God. Next thing you know, boom, he's having his survival. The next thing that happens, kaboom! You experience God. You know why? Because God shows up. God then intervenes and starts moving things around. Just catch it. If you want to have influence in the seven mountains, if you want to save America, then you have to take a look at what, what mountains are you primarily called to? Where is God talking to you? Where, what bothers you most is a key to where he's sending you. Then, are there other believers? Can you get two or three others that you can walk together with, pray about? Just let's seek God and see what God's doing. Then, as God shows up, you start getting invited to do the thing. This is what convergence is. I talked about it last night. Convergence is when you literally walk into the thing that God prepared you all your life to do. And you, it's a big role adjustment. Well, I didn't know he was called us to do this. We never did this before, but you obey him and bam, God shows up. This is the story in the Bible of every great exploit that ever happened. God calls a person seeking. He invites them to join him. They come into the Moses exploit. They're delivered from Egypt. They're building an ark. They're bringing forth a new tribe. They've got a new movement. My suggestion to you is that... Uh, you continue humbling yourself to let come what God wants to do. Think about how America has given this territory because we've separated ourselves from culture. And let's start thinking about a new model. It's this, it's not either or, it's both and. I'm training pastors now to have what I call hub churches. Jack Hibbs has one. Yes. And it's when, it's when you put your church over here, your local church, is interested in helping plant different points of influence in the community. So you've got people involved with government. You've got people involved with school. You've got people involved with youth. And as God leads, you start to put these apostolic missionary outposts at the tops of these mountains. Before you know it, you're shifting entire neighborhoods, counties, and communities. And people are coming to say, how did you do it? And your model goes to other places. It's happening now. That's the schematic for it. And it's all biblical. It just hasn't been done. The local church can get behind the micro church. Funny thing is, I talked to a communist 
<laughs> Economist Christian. He said, it's so funny, Lance. He said, you're talking about microchurch like this is some radical new idea. He said, how do you think we exist in a communist country? We don't have the big TBN show. Everything we do, we do in microchurch. We have to do it in small, disciplined communities that are seeking God and joining him in what he's doing. That's how we're penetrating our own world and surviving. So it's not that wild an idea. It's just for the West, it's a necessary idea. Let me pray for you. How many of you resonate with what I'm saying here? Does this make sense? Yeah. Your best days are your next days. Yes. Don't let the devil tell you that you're in the sunlight summit of your expiring uh, journey with Jesus. <laughs> what you have to do is see that your whole life was a preparation for the one final thing he's about to do through you. And that final thing may have a decade uh, before it expires. Convergence happens after 50 in the West, and by reason of health, you can stay in the flow of divine convergence, meaning live in the invitation and activation of God's zone up to like your 80s. And after that, you enter what's called legacy phase. You still don't expire. It's just that you're there for others to come to you to be inspired. They make the pilgrimage to Billy Graham and Oral Roberts and Pat Robertson because God leaves them there as a model of possibility for future leaders heading into convergence. That's why you're there. You still have a function. They want you to lay hands on them. They want to breathe the air you're in. They want, they'll never forget the words you say to them when you meet them at that stage. That's called legacy. Right now, my sense is God's inviting you into group convergence. Convergence for a group means when a number of people are all hitting the... The, the, the thing at the same time, God's inviting you to go up another level. And he's inviting you collectively to seek him for an invitation and an adjustment to engage him at the next level. So the children of Israel, when they had to cross over to the promised land, they had a group convergence experience. Problem was, the Jewish people weren't ready. Joshua and Caleb were ready. The rest of the tribes weren't. Why? Because look, they're too big, it's too much, we can't do it, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough people. If I was younger, maybe I would do it, but I can do it now. I'll give you all the Jewish excuses. Ten tribes said, this, I can't do it, I don't know why we're even here. Two tribes said, we can do it. Joshua and Caleb, the ones that saw they could do it, they got to do it. That's right. The generation that didn't enter into the invitation that God offered them, they all died going in circles. They died praying prayers God didn't answer, revolving around a church that didn't have the revival they were looking for with a country that wasn't being changed. We can't afford to let that happen. Yep. Yep. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, you will breathe your life into these bones, resurrection life. Enoch was translated. Lord, there's a translation generation. There's a generation that will escape the appointment with death. But we're praying that you will make us a generation that does the exploits that will satisfy the heart of Jesus. That he will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. We pray for a harvest of nations and a harvest of souls. We pray for our reformation grace to come in and answer all the unanswered prayers of generations past. For the revival and the awakening in America that will show up in government. God have mercy on this country. Give us four years of holding back the gates of hell so that we can run vigilantly and vigorously to do the work you've given us to do. I pray that everyone here will have light extension for the purpose of divine convergence, that none of us will appear empty-handed when we give an account for our labors and our life. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 Great job, Lance. Oh my God. Thank you, thank you. Oh, by the way, by the way, I didn't tell you this, but, and I know that this is so funny because most of the people that are my age, they can't find me on a podcast anyway unless one of their kids shows them how to do it. But, <laughs> what the Lord's got me doing right now, it's my name, Lance Walnut, N A U dot com. Go to forward slash podcast 
And what you do is you go to lancelon.com forward slash podcast because every day I do a prophetic analysis. I could talk to you right now. I could do a whole other message and so on and where you are on what's happening in Israel. The attack that happened, happened on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Right. Yes. Exactly. Most people miss the prophetic significance of this. It happened once the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the yet unfinished feast of God's end time visitation pouring out his spirit on the church for a harvest among the nations. Satan is trying to preempt and disrupt God's end time revival. He wants the world in a premature world war. And we are not looking at this like, I wonder if it's World War III in the rapture. No. Veto it. It's not supposed to be World War III. We got to command it to stop. It'll be for the expansion of Israel's strength. It's a shift in, in, in political tolerance for the crazy left, which has to be unmasked now as being lunatic. BLM, Antifa, left wing, pro choice. All these things get this veneer of credibility because there's so much of rebellion and confusion. But when you go kill the Jews, suddenly it's like, what? Even the left is having a wake up call. What do you mean, kill the Jew? What? Yeah, sure, BLM, but that, kill the Jews. We're, P, you know, we're for the PLO. They're realizing the school systems got so taken over by an alien ideology, their kids are anti Semites. <laughs> The Jewish donors are having an awakening right now. Yes. What the heck did we do at Harvard? Well, what's going on there? Hey, look, Maury, do you see what they're doing? <laughs> so this is all working out according to God's plan. Don't forget Flashpoint. Flashpoint is on. Yeah, Flashpoint, well, that's it. I need to let you know. So every Tuesday Flashpoint night. Army. On Tuesday night, uh, you can find Thursday. this on Flashpoints on various channels. So I think we do it on Daystar, Victory Channel, and I do news commentary. The point is. I did 20 minutes of prophetic biblical analysis of what's happening now based upon my premise that things are unfolding in a direction that God wants to actually shift nations. Amen. So I've got a theory I'm working on that says that the ultimate end game, it isn't over yet. It's not time for the Antichrist. There's going to be sheep nations and goat nations. Nobody even talks about it. When Jesus returns, he gathers the nations. Who are the sheep nations? They're the nations that will not actively engage in an agenda. That is anti-Jew or anti-Christian. Okay. Anti-Christ is going to go after Israel and believers. It's going to happen, but not everyone cooperates. And our job is to push that boundary back and bring in a harvest, including nations. I think there are sheep nations that Jesus wants. But anyway, you go to lancelon.com forward slash podcast, and uh, you can watch that. We did Flashpoint every Tuesday night. I talked for roughly only 10 minutes there. You get 25 minutes of me on my own show. <laughs> now everybody got these, right? These were in your bag last night. So you all got them, except for the two people that didn't go. It was over here. Somebody wasn't showing up last night. Take that over. <laughs> What's going on? Yes, they have a decade of a war expires. Convergence happens after 50 in the West, and by reason of health, you can stay in the flow of divine convergence, meaning live in that invitation and activation of God's zone up to like your 80s, and after that you enter what's called legacy phase. You still don't expire. It's just that you're there for others to come to you to be inspired. They make the pilgrimage to Billy Graham and Oral Roberts and Pat Robertson because God leaves them there as a model of possibility for future leaders heading into convergence. That's why you're there. You still have a function. They want you to lay hands on them. They want to breathe the air. They want, they'll never forget the words you say to them when you meet them at that stage. That's called legacy. Right now, my sense is God's inviting you into group convergence. Convergence for a group means when a number of people are all hitting the the, the, the thing at the same time, God's inviting you to go up another level. And he's inviting you collectively to seek him for an invitation and an adjustment to engage him at the next level. So the children of Israel, when they had to cross over to the promised land, they had a group convergence experience. Problem was, the Jewish people weren't ready. Joshua and Caleb were ready. The rest of the tribes weren't. Why? Because look, they're too big, it's too much, we can't do it, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough people, I'm not younger than the other do it. <laughs> I'll give you all the Jewish excuses. Ten tribes said this, I can't do it, I don't know why we're even here. Two tribes said, we can do it. Joshua and Caleb, the ones who saw they could do it, they got to do it. The generation that didn't enter into the invitation that God offered them, they all died going in circles. 
<laughs> they died praying prayers God didn't answer, revolving around a church that didn't have the revival they were looking for with a country that wasn't being changed. We can't afford to let that happen. Yep. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, you will bring your life into these bones, resurrection life. Enoch was translated. Lord, there's a translation generation. There's a generation that will escape the appointment of death. But we're praying that you will make us a generation that does the exploits that will satisfy the heart of Jesus. That he will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. We pray for a harvest of nations and a harvest of souls. We pray for our reformation grace to come in and answer all the unanswered prayers of generations past for the revival and the awakening in America that we show up in government. God have mercy on this country. Give us four years of holding back the gates of hell so that we can run vigilantly, vigorously to do the work you give us to do. I pray that everyone here will have light extension for the purpose of divine convergence. That none of us will appear empty handed when we give an account for our labor. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 Amen.